Welcome to our virtual public keynote address by Elijah Wald entitled My Culture, Right or Wrong, Thoughts About Music and Power. My name is Levy Gibbs and I'm an associate professor in the Asian Societies, Cultures and Languages program at Dartmouth College. Today's keynote is part of a two-day interdisciplinary Dartmouth conference on the power of song, the cultural politics of singers around the globe which seeks to produce an edited volume that can be used for college courses, exploring ways in which singers and songs of different genres from around the world come to represent regions, nations, and historical moments, while simultaneously becoming rich sites through which to consider questions of individual and collective identities. Our speaker today, Elijah Wald, is a musician, writer, and historian who has published on a broad range of music and cultural subjects. He worked for many years as the World and Roots music critic for the Boston Globe, has taught at UCLA, Boston College, and Temple University, and has published well over a thousand articles in the Boston Globe, the Los Angeles Times, and various magazines and journals. His dozen books include Narco Corrido, a survey of the modern Mexican ballads of drug smuggling, migration, and political corruption, How the Beatles Destroyed Rock and Roll, an alternative history of American popular music, Escaping the Delta, Robert Johnson and the Invention of the Blues, Global Minstrels, Voices of World Music, Dylan Goes Electric, Newport, Seeger, Dylan, and the Night That Split the 60s, and Dave Van Ronk's memoir of the New York folk revival, the mayor of MacDougall Street, the inspiration for the Coen Brothers movie Inside Lewin Davis. His awards include a 2002 Grammy for Best Album Notes, an ASCAP Deems Taylor Award, and special mention for the American Musicological Society's Otto Kinkodai Award. He is particularly known for exploring musical styles within broader sociocultural contexts as well as for original research on blues, Mexican and Chicano music, and the US folk revival. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming our speaker, Elijah Wald. Hi. Um, yeah, so first of all, thanks, Levy. Uh, thanks to Catherine Dara, who is doing the technical stuff for this, and to everyone attending this conference. Um, I'm sorry we can't all be in one room and all go out for drinks and conversation later, um, but I'm looking forward to hearing what everyone has to say over the next two days. And also to whoever else is watching or listening, welcome. And I'm going to try to figure out how to generally keep my eyes on the camera and look like I'm interacting with you. Uh, this talk will be more personal than most academic presentations in part because of the format. Uh, I find it hard to watch somebody talk on a computer screen, and I'm trying to deal with that by making this more conversational and taking advantage of the intimacy of being in a way face-to-face. -face. But there's another reason as well. Uh, this conference is about musical culture and the power of song, and it seems to me that any discussion of culture and power needs to start by exploring one's own culture and relationships to power. So I'm gonna start with a story about my father. My father was born in 1906 in Brooklyn. His parents were immigrant garment workers and he grew up as the only Jewish kid on a tough Irish block. Um, he was not happy about any of that and escaped by reading, doing electrical experiments and getting together with a friend and forming a little song and dance act. Uh, he knew all the pop songs of the 1920s, and I grew up with that music. He would sing things like When Francis Dances With Me and It's Three O'Clock in the Morning, and all sorts of songs that in retrospect strike me as marking ethnicity and ethnic differences. Uh, Sheik of Araby, Oh By Jingo, Mammy, Mother Macree. They say that Lena was the queen of Palestine. Just because she played the concertina. Um, that was the high point of immigrant influence in the United States. And I'd love to see more work done on how music reflected the powers of those new populations and the powers that marginalized them. 
but right now I want to tell a different story. My father was the first member of his family to go to college, and that was a great thing for him. He emigrated across the river from Brooklyn to Manhattan, which was a different world. He discovered the culture of classical music, of fine art, of literature, of theater. He got a doctorate in biology, married a young woman from Philadelphia's main line. And after his graduation, they went to Germany where he did a year of postdoctoral work. They started that year in Heidelberg where he had a research fellowship at the Kaiser Wilhelm Institute. My father always, recall, always recalled Heidelberg with affection. He loved the experience of living in a beautiful old European town with a castle on the hill and small streets with cobblestones and ancient stone houses. He enjoyed speaking German, which his parents had sometimes spoken at home, and connecting with his mother's Bavarian relatives. In Heidelberg, they had a little apartment on a small square, and every morning through his bedroom window, he'd hear groups of young men singing as they walked through the streets. He always remembered how lovely that sounded, the young voices echoing off the ancient stones in the early dawn. That was in 1932, and those young men with the Nazi brown shirts singing the Horst Vessel lead. My father knew who they were, and he was Jewish and a moderate leftist. He hated and feared them, and understood that the point of their morning marches was to remind everyone of who now was running Germany. But he was also a romantic young American living in Europe for the first time, doing research at a great institute in a beautiful town and connecting with his European roots. And he always remembered how beautifully they sang. That was almost 90 years ago. And the Horst Wessel lead is still illegal in Germany. I don't know of any other song that has been officially banned for that long. That's something worth thinking about at a conference called The Power of Song, a song so powerful that the most powerful nation in Europe has suppressed it for almost a century. That also might be a story about the power of music to transcend politics, that my father could appreciate the beauty of the singing despite what the singers represented. Or it could be a story about the dangers of music seducing people, making an emotional connection to a national culture as it did for my father, which was harnessed in horrific ways. In any case, it suggests some interactions of culture and power. In recent years, some musicologists have begun to study aggressive and negative uses of music, whether it's playing Bing Crosby songs at shopping malls to keep teenagers from gathering there, or jailers and interrogators playing heavy metal records as a form of torture. This conference is looking at ways music is used to unite or inspire people, which is a very different thing. But when we explore the power of song, that requires thinking not only about our relationships to songs and singers, but our relationships to power. I dropped out of college in 1977 when I was 18 and went off to Europe to be a wandering musician. I'd heard it would be easy for me to make a living there as an American singer and guitarist, and it was. I played a mix of blues, swing, country, and what was generally called folk music, but the specifics hardly mattered. American music was popular everywhere, and an authentic American had obvious advantages over Europeans attempting American accents. I mostly worked for tips in bars and restaurants, but during my first summer there, I booked a bunch of club dates in Germany and the clubs took me without hearing a note. It was enough that I was simply American. Of course, the popularity of American music went along with the popularity of American movies and television and fashions, and more broadly with the power of American mutant, uh, money and arms. Uh, once when I was playing in the streets in Rotterdam, a group of punk rockers about my own age started yelling Yankee go home at me. I pointed out that they were all wearing blue jeans and leather jackets, trying their best to look American. And they laughed and I ended up staying with them for a couple of days. But that's another story. My point here is that my livelihood for the next dozen years depended to a great extent on that intersection of culture and power. The music I played, whatever its other attractions, 
had been spread around the world as part of a larger story of the United States becoming a dominant and pervasive global power. And even a lot of people who adopted US fashions and loved that music realized the complications of that relationship. During that first year, I performed at a couple of folk festivals in Germany and was struck by the fact that virtually all the performers at those festivals played American music or Irish music or sometimes Eastern or Southern European music, but never German music. In that period, German folk music was verboten because it was still associated with the Nazis. Meanwhile, in the rest of Europe, young musicians who had grown up on Bob Dylan and Joan Baez were rediscovering and reviving their own national and regional folk styles. Some sought out older musicians and learned traditional instruments. Some fused old traditions with modern folk, jazz or rock. In Spain, La Pata Negra mixed flamenco with electric blues. In France, Malicorn blended bombards with balalaikas and electric bass. In Hungary, a group called Muzikash blended traditional Hungarian fiddling with blues harmonica and slide guitar. I made several trips to Budapest and a couple of times ended up playing intermission breaks at the dances Muzikash hosted every Thursday evening at a youth center there. By that time, they were playing strictly traditional instruments, but Shandor Churi, who had played slide guitar, was still a blues fan. And as an American, I could play blues in that setting without breaking the frame of cultural authenticity. That story gets a bit complicated because the Hungarian folk dance scene was deeply involved in preserving and promoting ethnic Magyar culture and the more devoted players and fans were making regular trips to Transylvania in Romania and tried to help musicians there and learn from them. And they talked about Transylvania, the mountain region that had previously been part of Hungary, the way folk fans in the United States talk about Appalachia or the Mississippi Delta as a place where poor disenfranchised rural people are keeping pure old traditions alive. As long as the Soviet Union controlled Hungary and Ceausescu ruled Romania, those links between Hungarian folk fans and Transylvanians, rather whether Magyars or Romani, helped everybody involved. But that got messier in the 1990s. As I understand it, during the Balkan Wars, Sándor, the blues fan in the group, took a strong nationalist stance, supporting the idea that Hungary should reclaim its lost territory in Romania and the former Yugoslavia. The other members of Muzikash were just as devoted to reviving musical traditions, but wanted nothing to do with the more aggressive forms of ethno-nationalism. And that split divided a lot of people in the Hungarian folk music world and ended with Sándor leaving Muzikash. The rest of the group is still going strong, and I recently listened to a BBC documentary about them, which, as it happens, is titled Blues for Transylvania. I can't help connecting that title with those early Musikash records with harmonica and slide guitar, but they haven't played anything like that in over 40 years. So what does blues mean in that context? Is it that their music speaks for and to its listeners in a deep emotional way? analogous to the way blues speaks for African-Americans or to Hungarian fans like Sándor? Or is it just a way of marketing Hungarian music to non-Hungarian fans who might be interested in that music, who might, might not be interested in that music, but like blues? That kind of marketing is quite common. Cesaria Evero was marketed as Cape Verdean blues. Ali Farcature was marketed as Malian blues. Rembedica is often marketed as Greek blues. Tango, I've heard marketed as Argentine blues, Enka even as uh, Japanese blues. Um, how did blues come to be a universal metaphor? And what is the metaphor? Are we thinking about Bessie Smith or Stevie Ray Vaughan? B.B. King or the Rolling Stones? In terms of culture and power, what gives that metaphor its power? And what culture is it referencing? I'll get back to blues in a moment, but first I have another family story. <laughs> 
My mother was born in Vienna and lived there until she was 14 when her family had to flee the Nazis. She made a good full life in the United States, but always considered herself a European and a refugee. While I was living in Europe, my grandmother died and my parents and sister came over and we all met up in Austria to scatter her ashes on the lake in Althausee, the mountain village near Salzburg where they had spent their summers. That's a picture of my mother and her brother and a friend there. We spent two or three days there and one evening we went out to dinner at a restaurant in the village. There was a bar downstairs, and as we were leaving, some old men began playing local music on accordion and fiddle. They sounded good, and I've always been interested in traditional music, so I suggested we stay and listen. I thought everyone would agree, since one of the points of the trip was for my sister and me to connect with our Austrian roots. My mother had been taking us to see places she remembered from her childhood, telling us stories about it, and making sure we tried all her favorite foods. But she took one look at that room full of happy Austrians drinking beer and singing along with the accordion. And she had to get the hell out of there. Uh, she had nice memories of her summers in the country when she wore a dirndl and her brother wore lederhosen. And they had a nice Austrian childhood. But then with the Anschluss, people like those men playing music in the restaurant stopped treating her as a little Austrian girl and started calling her a dirty Jew. And she and her family were lucky to escape and get to the United States. She still loved Vienna and the music of her childhood, which was Mozart and Beethoven and Schubert. She grew up in the days of Red Vienna. And I remember her tearing up during the movie Reds when they sang the Internationale. But Austro-German folk music to her was the sound of the people who destroyed all of that the sound of nationalism, racism, and genocide. So that's another story about the power of music. It's also a story about my family and my heritage and how it can get confusing. I'm currently working on the memoir of a friend of mine, Jack Landrone, who used to be known as Jackie Washington. Jack is 20 years older than me and grew up in Roxbury, a few miles from where I grew up in Cambridge. He was a popular performer in the early days of the 60s folk revival, along with Pete Seeger and Bob Dylan and all those people. But his story is a bit different because he's black and Puerto Rican. He was originally marketed as the male Joan Baez and sang English and Appalachian ballads and the usual range of folk revival stuff. But his core repertoire was always the music he heard at home, Puerto Rican decimas and aguinaldos, Mexican boleros, and some Calypso style songs he learned from his grandmother who was from St. Thomas. He was puzzled and amused by a lot of the white kids on the folk scene. Uh, he recalls Harvard students with names like Nigel Farnsworth, getting up in work shirts and boots and singing about riding freight trains and making moonshine. Or the sort of singer he generically calls Wild Joe Fiddlestein shouting about how they woke up this morning with the blues all around my head. We're good friends, but have had some difficult conversations about my own musical choices. Jack asks why I never play the music of my own culture, by which he means Jewish music. When he was a kid, Roxbury still had an aging population of Jewish immigrants, and he interacted with them and heard their music. And later he did some gigs with an Israeli dance troupe and learned some Israeli songs. He hears a similarity between black and Jewish music, the minor keys and rhythmic accents and the way both cultures have made humor and beauty out of painful and horrific experiences. So he's puzzled and not just puzzled but often irritated that all these Jewish musicians on the US folk scene keep trying to sound like Appalachian hillbillies or Mississippi sharecroppers rather than playing stuff from our own tradition. Like, who are we kidding? And why? Um, I understand what bothers him about that. But at the same time, I feel no connection to what he calls Jewish music. My grandmother and my mother were classical pianists. My father played cello, and I grew up hearing them play Bach duets. 
as well as hearing my father's inexhaustible repertoire of 1920s pop hits. I discovered Pete Seeger when I was seven, then Woody Guthrie and Cisco Houston, then Josh White, Lead Belly, Mississippi John Hurt. My older half-brother played blues guitar and I started playing when I was nine years old and have now been playing American folk and blues along with smatterings of other styles for more than 50 years. Neither my parents nor my grandparents played or listened to any of what Jack calls Jewish music. And I don't remember hearing any music I thought of as distinctively Jewish until I moved to New York in my late teens. In those days, there were still a few old men who would gather in Washington Square Park on sunny days with guitars and mandolins and play Yiddish theater songs. Uh, incidentally, they did not use the word Yiddish. Uh, they called both the music and the language Jewish. I enjoyed listening to them the same way I enjoyed listening to old Italian men with guitars and mandolins playing Italian songs. It was pretty music and I enjoyed having the direct experience of that culture, but it didn't feel particularly like my culture. I was at NYU, which in those days was still often called NY Jew. Um, and we sometimes had discussions or arguments about Jewish identity, but the people I was arguing about were spending their evenings at CBGB's listening to the Ramones while I was taking guitar lessons from Dave Van Ronk and learning songs off records by Ramblin' Jack Elliott and Blind Willie McTell. I was aware that Jack Elliott was Jewish and may well have known that a couple of the Ramones were. And I certainly knew about Bob Dylan being Bob Zimmerman. I'm not saying I was paying no attention to that kind of thing, but I didn't connect being Jewish to playing or listening to a particular kind of music for the obvious reason that the Jews I knew didn't play or listen to any particular kind of music. I first heard what's now called Kletzmer music in the 1980s, when some young American musicians started reviving that style. And frankly, most of it sounded to me like mediocre jazz and I didn't pay much attention to it. As it became more popular, I occasionally got into conversations with people who thought I should pay attention to Kletzmer because I was Jewish and it was my tradition. I found that honestly a bit irritating since as far as I know, no one in my family had ever cared for that music. Historically, Kletzmer was the music of Eastern European Jewish communities and all of my grandparents were Jewish and came from Eastern Europe, but we don't carry music in our DNA. And I don't even know if those great grandparents listened to anything resembling what's now called Kletzmer. So I resented other people telling me it was my music. Like if no one in my family listened to it, I don't much like it, I don't play it. In what sense is it mine? Do you think I sound defensive? Am I protesting too much? Does my rejection of Kletzmer and the amount of time I'm spending on this suggest to you that at least to some degree I'm rejecting or uncomfortable about my cultural or ethnic identity? Let me tell you another story. A couple of years ago, I embarked on a project about immigration and nationalism, as part of which I traveled to Poland and in particular to the area around Przemysl, where both my father's father and my mother's mother grew up. It was an interesting trip in many ways. Uh, for one thing, I'd heard all sorts of things about Poland, but nobody had told me how beautiful it was. Uh, it's a gorgeous country and I very much enjoyed traveling around it. It's also a complicated country. For example, I was surprised to find small Muslim villages in the rural Northeast that have been there since the 14th century with beautiful old wooden mosques. Way up in the Northeast corner of the country, I spent a couple of days at the Borderlands Institute, which organizes conferences, concerts, and other events, bringing together people from all the various ethnicities in that region and elsewhere. The Institute has bought and restored the town synagogue in Seni, which the Nazis had turned into a fire station. It's now an art center and performance space. And the night I arrived, the local Kletzmer Orchestra was giving a concert there. Here's a short clip of video from that performance. 
The Saini Kletzmer Orchestra is an amateur all ages group and the room was packed with enthusiastic relatives and neighbors. They played well and I was interested to be there. But as I looked around the room, it felt increasingly weird that I was at a Kletzmer concert in a synagogue in Poland and I was the only Jew in the room. So the following night, when the Institute's founder and director asked me how I'd liked it, I told him that, that it was nice, but it felt kind of weird being the only Jew there. And he said, yes, we think it's important to keep this culture alive to show that Hitler did not win. Now, I didn't respond and the conversation drifted to other subjects, but I was startled because this man is the director of an institute that works to bridge ethnic divides and combat racism and nationalism rising in that region. And he's intelligent and thoughtful. And yet it didn't seem to occur to him that the fact that I was the only Jew at a Klezmer concert in a synagogue in Poland was proof that in terms of wiping out local Jewish culture, Hitler had been completely successful. And I couldn't help wondering whether the people playing and enjoying that concert would have played and enjoyed that music if there were still any Jews around. When I told that story in an earlier talk, I titled the talk, It's Easy to Love Us When We're Dead. I wanna emphasize, I was not traveling around Poland with a chip on my shoulder. I was trying to get a sense of my family's Polish past and I found a lot that I liked there but there were some other odd moments, like a visit to the Galician equivalent of Plymouth Plantation or Colonial Williamsburg, a preserved historic village from the late 19th century, which was right around the time my grandparents left, um, with a blacksmith shop, a cobbler, an instrument maker, several wooden churches, a small oil field, and a Jewish house, complete with a Jew, who played the barrel organ and explained the odd and interesting customs those people used to have. He was funny and knowledgeable and wore a name tag saying his name was Aaron and there was a yarmulke on his desk. So at the end of the tour, I asked him, are you Jewish? He grinned, pointed at his watch and said, till six o'clock. This stuff is infinitely complicated. In Wuj, I was researching the life of Julian Tuvim, a poet who was one of Poland's most popular songwriters in the 20s and 30s. He was Jewish and had to leave during the war, but came back afterwards and died there in the late 1950s. His songs are still known to everyone in Poland. There's a street named after him in the center of town and a statue on the main pedestrian mall sitting on a bench with a book in his hand, which is nice but my guidebook mentioned a quaint local custom. Passersby rub his nose for luck. You can see how shiny it is, the Jew's nose. As it happened that same month, I read that the tourist board of Statesboro, Georgia had dedicated a statue of blind Willie McTell. Like the two of him statue, he's sitting on a bench and tourists have their pictures taken beside him. In the pictures I found, virtually all those tourists have been white. I don't wanna overstate that analogy. Unlike Jews in Poland, there's still plenty of African-Americans in Georgia and even some African-American guitarists. But I wasn't surprised when I read about the statues unveiling to find that the musician who performed McTell's Statesboro Blues at the ceremony was white. Now, to be clear, I'm white and I play Statesboro Blues. Not only that, in 1991, when Columbia Records paid for a memorial to be erected for Robert Johnson in the Mississippi graveyard where he may be buried, I was part of the trio that played at the ceremony and all three of us were white. It was in the churchyard of Mount Zion Missionary Baptist Church and almost all the spectators were local and black and they seemed to enjoy the music. So it wasn't quite like that Klezmer concert in Poland. But I've been at an awful lot of blues shows that were. Um, it's common for blues clubs and blues festivals to be in neighborhoods where very few black people live and to draw audiences that are uniformly white, often listening to bands that are uniformly white. 
That's often true even in venues intended to evoke black history like Beale Street in Memphis. Uh, and in that way, the celebration of blues tradition on Beale Street or in Buddy Guy's Club in Chicago or in a lot of other blues clubs and festivals all over the United States can feel a lot like that celebration of Klezmer in Saini. Among other things, because it's not unusual for blues clubs to be located in sites of ethnic cleansing. Beale Street, the main street of Black Memphis, was urban renewed out of existence in the 1970s and recreated decades later as an entertainment strip pointedly focused on attracting white tourists. And part of that project was transforming it in the public imagination from a center of Black culture into a center of blues culture. In its heyday, Beale Street was not a blues street. It was the main street of Black Memphis with dry goods, hardware, furniture, and clothing stores, pawn shops, restaurants, a barber, a dentist, and some music venues featuring orchestras and smaller combos that played blues and jazz and whatever other music was popular at the time. Memphis remains a largely Black city. And the modern Beale Street has some black clubs featuring current R&B, along with the tourist-centered blues clubs. But in most parts of the United States, blues clubs are reliably situated in white neighborhoods and suburbs. The decor of those clubs is reliably retro, assuring listeners that what they're hearing is the music of another time, a vanished culture that is remembered with respect and affection, and quite different from the hostile mechanical beats of 21st century urban blackness. That distinction is regularly underlined by white blues fans. Every time I give a talk on blues history, a middle-aged white man will reliably raise his hand and ask why young African-Americans aren't interested in blues. I've tried out various responses to that over the years. Uh, my first response was the same reason you aren't interested in Guy Lombardo. Then I switched to looking around at what is inevitably a room full of middle-aged white people and saying, because the audience at most blues concerts these days looks like us. My current response is, what the hell do you call Beyonce? I settled on that last one for a couple of reasons. First, because it's obvious. There's a direct, clear lineage from Bessie Smith to Billie Holiday, Dinah Washington, Etta James, Aretha Franklin, Whitney Houston, up to Beyonce. And second, to make the point that if you want to engage with blues as a living Black cultural tradition, all you have to do is engage with the evolution of living Black culture, which is to say living Black people. And that's very different from claiming a deep affinity with Black culture because you love the music of Black people who are no longer around. Now, I love old blues, but I grew up in Cambridge, Massachusetts, and I was immersed in that music as part of the culture of my youth, the culture Jack mocks when he talks about Wild Joe Fiddlestock. Already in the 1960s, people on that scene were lamenting that young Black Americans had abandoned their culture meaning the culture we liked and celebrated as connecting us to the Black Americans we respected and supported, but who somehow were rarely in the rooms where we were celebrating their music. Of course, there was also plenty of Black, black music on the pop charts, but blues fans tended to dismiss most of it as gussied up and watered down for a commercial mainstream, which is to say mostly white audience. In that context, um, I'd like to show a clip of the Chicago blues guitarist Buddy Guy from 1965, when he was still mostly performing in black clubs on the south side of Chicago, playing the music black fans of that period wanted to hear. The way I did it, babe. The way you kissed me too. 
clip was filmed on the opening night of a multi-act European blues tour. And we're lucky to have it because before the next concert, the promoters took Guy aside and explained that the audience wasn't there to hear James Brown hits. It was the blues show and they wanted to hear blues, which already in 1965 meant the roots, the music black people used to play before rock and roll and the soul revolution and black power when they were really in touch with their culture, picking cotton in Mississippi. That's a nasty way of framing the attitude, but it's not new. People like Julius Lester were already making that point at the time. Um, 50 years later, Buddy Guy is the elder statesman of the blues revival. And this is the cover of his most recent album. I would suggest that this kind of marketing is not entirely different or even separate from the 19th century marketing of old plantation songs performed by singers in blackface makeup. A mix of appreciation for black music and an at best ambiguous relationship to black people. An ambiguity Eric Lott, who's at this conference, summed up in the title of his book on that subject as love and theft. I'm making that point about the marketing not about Guy himself. Guy genuinely grew up in Letsworth, Louisiana, and I understand that he relaxes around his Chicago home in overalls. His recent albums have focused on older blues styles from long before James Brown, but it's not unusual for performers in their 80s to be nostalgic for the music of their childhood. And I have no reason to think that's just because he spent the last 50 years performing for audiences of white blues fans. My point's not about him, but about those audiences. And it's that a culture of white Americans who play or love blues, like a culture of Polish Gentiles who play or love Kletzmer music, is Polish Gentile or white American culture. And the ways we hear, play, and understand the music are culturally determined by who and where we are in 2020 just as much as the tastes and understandings of rural Jews or blacks were determined by their situations in Poland or Mississippi a hundred years ago. That's not a criticism, but it is a description and a reminder that if you love the music of someone else's ancestors, that doesn't necessarily mean you appreciate their culture. In fact, it often means the opposite that you don't acknowledge the validity or legitimacy of their culture as their culture is today. It seems to me that the metaphor of blues may be less about musical similarities than about that relationship, about appreciating music we find deep and meaningful from a culture other than our own, which often does not match how people in that culture see themselves or what they think of as their music. I've unavoidably had to think about those relationships as a white musician playing blues and as a white male Anglo writer and researcher who often explores styles of music that were originally made and heard within black, Latino, female or other groups in which I may be less than fully welcome. And I've had to recognize that other people often understand the music very differently than the ways I understand it. A lot of us are making those efforts, trying to be conscious and thoughtful about those issues and our own shortcomings when we write about what I'm gonna call marked ethnicities, people and cultures we recognize as different and special. But of course, that marking itself is a matter of culture and power. I shared the poster of this talk on Facebook with pictures of that Buddy Guy album and Staff Sergeant Barry Sadler's Ballad of the Green Berets, and a friend who, as it happens, has Bob Dylan's self-portrait as her Facebook avatar, wrote, I hope Barry Sadler is not your example of white culture, LOL. That comment startled me a little, because although the juxtaposition was pretty obvious, I hadn't actually thought of the Sadler cover in quite those terms. Like many white people, I find it easier to think of black culture as a thing than to think of white culture that way, since I'm viscerally aware that there's no single white culture. When it comes to Barry Sadler, if by my culture one means the people I grew up with around Cambridge or tend to hang out with in Philadelphia 
or those of us at this conference are watching this, I would guess most of us regard the ballad of the Green Berets as something between an, an atrocity and a joke or a combination of both. But in a conference dealing with iconic singers and songs, it certainly fits that bill. Um, another Facebook friend who grew up outside Dayton, Ohio, recalls that in 1966, her elementary school class performed the Ballad of the Green Berets at a school pageant with the girls wearing Girl Scout berets and boys doing maneuvers with BB guns. Discussions of topical songs of the 1960s tend to focus on people like Bob Dylan, Joan Baez, and Phil Oaks, or if they go a bit deeper on the freedom songs of the Southern Civil Rights Movement. But Sadler's song was by far the most popular topical recording of that decade. It was the best-selling single of 1966, was all over radio and television, inspired a movie starring John Wayne. And it also went to number one in South Africa, made the top 10 in Germany, and apparently is now the theme song of the Dutch Army's Commando Corps and the anthem of the Officers' School of the Swiss Armed Forces. How's that for white culture? As it happens, in 1987, I spent an interesting night as Barry Sadler's guest in his house outside Guatemala City. He told me that record was still paying him about $10,000 a year because whenever anyone made a movie that was set in the mid 1960s, that song was on the soundtrack. He was pretty funny about it. He always referred to it as the green beanie and remembered sitting at home in New Mexico watching the Boston Pops Orchestra on television. They started playing the green beanie. I couldn't believe it, a whole symphony orchestra playing my song. And I was watching them going G, C, G, D, G. Speaking of icons, Arthur Fiedler conducted the Boston Pops for almost 50 years. They made over 150 albums. In 1965, they released one per month, 12 albums that year. They were on television every week through my youth and played every year at the 4th of July fireworks. And they played the opening of Disneyland. Everybody knew Arthur Fiedler and the Boston Pops. They were the soundtrack of middle-class America. But try to find an academic study or article or even a paragraph about Arthur Fiedler in any history of American popular music. I gather there is currently a book in the works that will go some way to filling that blank. But last week I did a pretty exhaustive search and found nothing. That's interesting, because if you wanted to pick an iconic example of mainstream American musical culture in the mid 1960s, the Boston Pops playing the Ballad of the Green Beret on national television would be a pretty strong contender. Incidentally, uh, Fiedler's parents were Austrian Jews, and my grandmother always said he looked like a family of Fiedlers she knew back in Przemysl. But anyway, when I chose the two album covers to advertise this talk, I was thinking of the Buddy Guy cover as an example of how artists are presented as icons or stereotypes of particular cultures, often by and for outsiders. And the Barry Sadler cover I thought of as an example of how we choose not to pay attention to some very popular and significant artists and music in our own cultures, because we don't like their work or what they represent. That obviously ties into a lot of discussions we're having these days, both about how Black, Latino, and other people of color are represented in the United States, and about whether Donald Trump and his voters represent who we are as a country. I find a lot of those discussions problematic because people are trying to come up with answers or think they already have answers. And I think it's vital to recognize that those questions are infinitely complicated and will keep changing. And we need to be open to those complications and changes. I've been trying to suggest throughout this talk that even the most iconic singers and styles are heard and understood very differently depending on the context, the moment, and who's doing the understanding. There's a wonderful passage in Tony Seeger's book, Why Suya Sing, uh, which is a terrific study of how music functions in society, 
based on work he did with indigenous people in the Amazon. He tells about carefully setting up his microphone to capture the performance of a group of singers without getting interference from the surrounding crowd who were imitating bird calls, shouting comments to each other and laughing. He was proud of making a clean recording of what was to him the music. But when he played it for the performers, they were terribly disappointed with the result, he writes. It wasn't beautiful, they said. It wasn't euphoric. It excluded an essential part of the performance. His solution was to show people in the village how to use a tape recorder so he could hear what they chose to record, not just the sounds he singled out as musical. But of course, that still meant separating those sounds from environments in which many other things were happening that would not be preserved on tape, some of which were undoubtedly more significant to some of the people experiencing them. Music is always heard as part of a larger context. And the power of song is always not just the power of the song itself or of the singer. There's always a larger power or a mix of powers which shape its context, its intended and unintended meanings, and our various understandings and relationships to all of that. And to the extent a song is invested with those powers, it's also invested with their virtues, threats, or dangers, or more accurately, their virtues, threats, and dangers. My father could remember the music of the brown shirts as beautiful, because even though he understood it as threatening, it had another message for him that was also important and meaningful. The German folk audiences of my time avoided German songs because they could not separate them from that mix of associations and meanings. And they recognized the attraction my father felt as in itself threatening. Austrians continue to perform and treasure their folk songs, their equally German folk songs, because they framed themselves as victims rather than perpetrators of the Nazi horrors. And my mother, who had experienced them as perpetrators, heard their cheerful accordion music as part of the same culture as the Horst Wessel lead. I know people who have that reaction to white country music, who hear hillbilly hoedowns as the soundtrack of lynch mobs or with the luxury of distance, who don't associate the old hoedowns with white Southern racism, but hear contemporary country music as the sound of modern white racism. As a musician and as a hitchhiker, I've been lucky enough to move through a lot of different worlds and cultures. That evening with Barry Sadler was part of a long trip hitchhiking and playing from my room and board down the Atlantic coast of the United States and on through Mexico and Guatemala. I played with white country bands. I played for black tap dancers in New Orleans. I played with a black Zydeco band outside Mamou, Louisiana. I played with a bunch of different Mexican bands. That would have been a very hard trip to make if I were not white male and a US citizen. All of those things helped me, not only in interactions with other white male Americans, but everywhere and with everybody. Had I not been all those things, I'm also guessing I would not have hit it off with Barry Sadler. He was in Guatemala, among other things, to assist the right-wing Contras fighting against the government in Nicaragua. His buddy Duke, who was also there that night, had spent 12 years as the bass player for Jerry Lee Lewis's band and was just back from training the Colombian Special Forces in hand-to-hand -hand combat. I disagreed not only with their politics, but with the ways they treated the people around them. And when I heard a few months later that Sadler had been shot in mysterious circumstances, I was neither surprised nor sad. And yet, I remember that evening with pleasure. If you think that makes me complicit with some ugly choices and exercises of power, that's kind of my point, that I don't stand outside any of this. I usually frame myself as white, but at times in this talk, I've suggested that I also have a marked identity. And my sense of that sometimes surfaces in ways that surprise me. For example, the first paper coming up in this conference is about Pete Seeger, one of my heroes who did a great deal to shape my tastes and my understanding of the role of music in society. I hadn't thought about this before, but in the context of this talk, it strikes me that a Jewish performer 
couldn't have played the role Pete Seeger played in the folk revival. The power of Pete Seeger was among other things, the power of being a tall white Protestant man who could trace his ancestry back to the Mayflower pilgrims, being Johnny Appleseed as he put it, not only in his music, but in his appearance and ancestry. In a world of Jewish communists, part of his moral authority and power derived from being able to get up in front of the House on American Activities Committee and sing, our fathers bled at Valley Forge, the snow was red with blood, with the assurance that his ancestry was every bit as red, white, and blue as any John Birchers. That's not a criticism of Seeger at all. He was a dedicated internationalist and devoted much of his life to battling racism and white supremacy. But it's a reminder that the powers singers access and employ may overlap or even be the same as the powers they're fighting to dismantle. Or to put it differently, this shit is complicated. At various moments in this talk, I've implied my familial relationship to what is commonly called the Holocaust. So I do want to note that the current Israeli government recently nominated a man with a history of human rights abuses who's advocated the ethnic cleansing of the West Bank to be the director of the Holocaust Museum and Research Center in Jerusalem. I am, of course, ferociously opposed to that, as I am to much of what I've seen in Israel and the occupied territories. And like Seeger, I try to use the moral authority of my own family history to counter the power of people who claim authority based on having similar histories. To finish up, if some of what I've said today sounded bitter or cynical, I'm sorry about that. I don't want to sound that way. I'm a musician. I love music. I'm specifically a folk musician and specifically love music that connects me to particular cultures and histories and people and places. But I don't love power. So I'm going to end this talk with a final thought about the power of song. I do believe songs and music can have power and that we can harness that power at times to do wonderful things. But the power of song is not inherently more virtuous than other kinds of power. And if it's more attractive or beautiful, its attraction and beauty are also a source and often an effect of power. Those of us who love, play, and study music tend to celebrate it. And that's fine, that's wonderful. But in this context, we have a responsibility to also recognize the complexity of its attractions, its meanings, and potentially its dangers. And to recognize that we also have power and are subject to power and do not stand outside of any of the things we're discussing. And with that, Thank you very much for listening, and I look forward to the discussion. Eric Lott says he has a question. Great to be in everyone's company, and Elijah's certainly. Uh, dude, I knew it was going to be good. I knew it was going to be this good. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, the wealth and the range of directions you went is just super fascinating to me. We could talk about it all afternoon and look forward to that. Um, but um, sort of to put a pin on it, uh, you know, a lot of what you're trying to, a lot of what you were, a lot of what you were talking about, you know, in in, in various um, in various ways was linking up notions of roots to notions of music. And I've always thought roots are phony. I mean, that's why I entered with the minstrel show. Roots are phony. You know this too. I'm not telling you anything. Roots are made up, they're invented traditions. So well, I'm wondering if you might comment, for example, on Eric Weisbard's notion of formats as opposed to, I mean, you were, you're not invested in, in roots, seems to me. Um, well, you're interested um, in, in inquiring into the relationship between musics and roots. 
actually and that's I'm why that buddy guy thing is so interesting to me. okay hold on just one second my yeah sure that's why that buddy guy thing is so interesting to me because he knows exactly what he's doing he's trying to raise some funds for the club to keep the club going it's not about an investment in the blues as such it seems to me and other questions but thank you for your talk um so I'm actually going to go somewhere with Roots because I think the problem with Roots is that people don't actually think about that metaphor and that it's a terrific metaphor because Roots don't exist before plants. Um, roots start growing down as the same from the same place that the plant grows up and grow down in ways that nourish the plant as it grows up. And that's in fact exactly what we mean by roots. If we want to look at the roots of the Rolling Stones, you start with the Rolling Stones and you look backwards trying to find things that will nourish the idea you're building of the Rolling Stones. And that's in fact exactly how we use roots is by finding uh, we could say, you know, the invented traditions thing again. Um, when Hobsbawm used that term, he was very, very conscious of the fact that what he meant was all traditions are invented. Not that there are some traditions that are false and invented, but that taking something and singling it out as a tradition is an active process. And I would say the same about roots. It's an active process of finding pasts, real or not, that feed what you're trying to build in the present and future. And so I actually think roots is a terrific metaphor. We just use it wrong. All right, it looks like we have another question from Jeffrey Summit. Hey, Jeff. Hey, Elijah, good to see you. That was an excellent talk. Thank you so much, it was great. Um, and from our connections, it brought up lots of issues for me in a, in a really thoughtful way. Um, your talk did it in a very thoughtful way. I, you know, a lot of the complexity of our connections to certain styles of music is very much about a negotiation within constraints. And uh, I, it made me think a lot about the parameters of possible, our possible choice and agency on this because in some places we have choice and agency and in other places we have no choice and agency. And I wondered if you could talk more, you talked about this in your talk a lot, but about the power of choice and agency when it comes to connection to, um, to different musics. Um, for me personally, the place that that comes into play is trying to always be aware that other people have as much choice and agency as I have. Uh, I'm constantly in situations where people are discussing musicians as if they were simply playing the music of their culture, whereas I had the free choice to roam all over the globe. And the thing that's so funny about that is that for us as Americans, uh, everywhere we go on the planet, when we walk into a room, people know more about our music and culture than we know about theirs. And, you know, we go in studying stuff. And very often, the process of our studying is starting by saying, no, 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 don't play the American stuff, play your stuff. While they're going around saying, wait a minute, but I, you know, I, I'm was really struck by this because I was recently doing a project that involved looking at global rap. And it is virtually impossible to find a study of rap anywhere in the world that asks what people are listening to, what rap fans are listening to. Because when people want to talk about rap in Nigeria, they want to talk about Nigerian rap, not how many Nigerians are listening to 50 Cent. And it's if you want to ask the question, so, you know, this Tanzanian rapper you're writing about, how popular is she relative to Nicki Minaj? Um, 
nobody wants to answer that question, except I, I'm sure if you walked into any bar in Tanzania, they would be happy to explain to you how much more likely they are to listen to Nicki Minaj. Uh, so I guess that's really where I come out on this, is, is sort of trying to remind myself, as I said in the talk, that, that my choices and tastes are as socially determined as the choices and tastes of the people who I'm looking at and that they are looking at me and that everything they say to me is based on them looking at me and what they want to say to me. Um, and just remembering that they're always making choices too. Um, may I add a request to take the thoughts you were just talking about and maybe also touch on a role that I am familiar with, cultural broker. When one is certainly in the United States, sometimes mediating between yeah. the mainstream white audiences who think they know something or may know nothing about a folk music, a folk style, a folk root. Um, sure. Uh, what, talk about that a little bit, please. Sure, happily. Um, I mean, that's a world I've been very involved with uh, as a reporter for the Boston Globe for many years, covering what was called world music. Uh, and it's very complicated. There are instances where cultural bro brokers sail in and everything works great. But I've also been aware of many instances where the cultural broker's interest is not necessarily the same as the interest of the performers where the performers would like a top 40 hit, whereas the cultural broker wants to prove how much better what they're doing is than that shit on the top 40. <laughs> um, bingo, bingo. <laughs> and yeah, so it can get very, very messy. I've known any number of cases of cultural brokers, I would say standing in the way of uh, the interests of the people who they were quote helping. Yeah. Yeah, thank you. Oh, if I may make one more comment about the musicians in Poland playing the klezmer music. What I noticed was they weren't playing what I would usually think comes in the under the heading of klezmer music. It might squeak by as a terkisher but it was really a Rome tune from the Balkans. And it was in 8-8 and they were playing it with much more of a Serbian Macedonian brass band style than what which I would think of as we may an have American all, style. Yeah, frankly, which may have a lot to do with how many American Jews have come in to work with them and do klezmer and how many American Jewish klezmer musicians are also interested in playing all of those other styles. I mean, uh, you know, this is infinitely yes, yes. complicated. And I should add that, you know, let me tell you, while we're going on this one, let me add one other little story. Because my father got to spending time in Germany in the 1980s and came back at one point with a tape of a German klezmer trio. And he was very cheerful about them because he had a good friend over there and one of them, her son was in the group. And I had this immediate visceral reaction of what business do Germans have playing Kletzmer? And that actually very much transformed. It was interesting. It was this visceral in an instant going, oh God, that's why my black friends are so irritated when I play blues, um, which should have been obvious and which I knew intellectually, but I hadn't thought of it that viscerally. But since then, being involved with people in the klezmer scene, I know all these Jewish klezmer musicians, both in the US and in Israel, who were simply thrilled with the German klezmer scene. So I'm not trying to generalize. I'm, again, I'm talking about my own reactions. Uh, but there is a lot of interaction between American and some Israeli klezmer people and the klezmer revival going on in Poland and Germany. It's, it's much more complicated than the short way I touched on it in my talk. I think one of the, one of the things, if I may add a footnote to that, that I'm reminded of was um, the choreographer Dick Crum, who worked with 
Pittsburgh Tammies and many other uh, folk dance performance groups in the US who in a, many of his talks would talk about the freedom that Americans have to pick and choose the cultural, what, things sure. that resonate with them. And in some ways, this is just another example, as I see it, of that American sense that we can be free to pick and choose anything we want. And we can mix our aroma and our klezmer and our tamburitsa stuff and come up with something that's ethnic, folk, I don't know. Um, I would say, Yes, we do that, but so does everybody else. I mean, I studied guitar in the Congo with Jean Bosco Mwenda, who's considered the father of, of Congolese pop music, really. Um, and he started out imitating uh, country and Western songs and the trio Matamoros and some American gospel and Jimmy Rogers and Cowboy Yodeling and fusing it with his local musics and basically thought of what he was doing as combining a guitar style um, based on local stuff with a singing style based on country and Western. I mean, it's, it's not that we're the only ones who can pick and choose and mingle. It's that at times we're the only ones who are interested in hearing us do that because we want other people to do other things. And God knows we're not the only ones who feel that way either. When I was in the Congo, they wanted me to sing uh, Don Williams because I was an American and that's what Americans were supposed to do. So I sang Don Williams. I do my job. Nancy? I think we have a question from Nancy Cobb. I think she might be having some difficulty uh, unmuting and starting her video. Oh, here we go. Okay. Oh, do I have to put on my video in order to talk? <laughs> no, nope, we're hearing you. Okay, good. Um, well, thanks. I loved your talk, Elijah, and uh, thanks for mentioning me. I got a kick out of that, too. I'm the Facebook person you talked about. But anyway, I had a question about Pete Seeger, and you're saying that he had the power to be able to say what he did to the House on American Activities Committee. And then when, you know, things got to a point in Newport and they were talking about um, replacing Pete and everyone wanted Bob Dylan to be his replacement, everyone except for Bob. And uh, I just wonder why they never considered Joan Baez. I mean, she's the queen, you know, and he was the king and she could have done it. You know, I think she could have kept folk music really more popular for a while, but it just seemed like nobody considered her. Um, yeah. Uh, I, I mean, aside, obviously we're talking about sexism and yeah, no question. Uh, I would say incidentally though, that nobody was replacing Pete Seeger with Bob Dylan. Pete Seeger was the sort of person who when he was off stage organized the Newport Folk Festival. I mean, Pete Seeger was always somebody who was working together to be part of a bigger thing. In fact, even when he was doing solo concerts, the whole thing was, I'm just one of you singing with you. Whereas Bob Dylan was always singing at people. And again, that's not a criticism and Bob Dylan himself frames it that way. Um, I mean, I wrote a whole book on Seeger Dylan and Newport. Um, so I should probably stop now because I could go down a lot of rabbit holes. Well, I'm interested in your rabbit holes and I'm very sorry that that didn't, uh, that movie got put on hold because um, I really would have loved to see uh, that director's view of your book. <laughs> well, it may still surface. Good. So we have a question from Carol Silverman. Okay, we're seeing you, but not yet hearing you. 
you need to unmute somehow. Hi there. Can you hear me Hi. now? Yeah, yep. great. Thank you so much, Elijah, for the very provocative lecture that drew in so many interesting strands. I wanted to pick up on um, one or two of them. Uh, first of all, the whole um, rise of ethno-nationalism, white supremacy, and music. I think maybe a missing piece in your talk is actually the soundtrack of white supremacy at the current moment around the world. And I think it's really important. I mean, I work in Eastern Europe, so if you look at how folklore and folk music itself is being reconfigured in Bulgaria, Poland, Hungary, many places, you will turbo see folk. that. Uh, well, turbo folk is an earlier thing, but yeah. there's other genres. Which sure. genres tend to be chosen to represent the nation and therefore be exclusive to our national purity. Uh, again, this is the philosophy of supremacy in all of these places around the world, including in the United States, of which music people, uh, and music is really important and folklore is really important in these movements. Just to give you an example, I work in Bulgaria and there's this irony that um, older styles or I mean, even styles from the 70s that are now considered old are being reinvented, but they're played by Roma. So you want their music and they're on stage, but actually all the rhetoric is xenophobic, anti-refugee, anti-gypsy, and so on. So there's all mm -hmm. these irony. Uh, your example of the Tons House is really interesting because currently the Tons House is actually a site of ethno-nationalism. Uh, last time I was in Hungary, I was told to take off my button that said, I stand with Central European University, because that university is coded as a Western human rights bastion of European supremacy tied to George Soros, who's Jewish, sure. and anti-Semitism, anti-Roma, anti-refugee is all about then finding out what we are, looking to our past and elevating um, Transylvanian music as some pure bastion. So sure. this is happening in the United States as well. Uh, ben Teitelbaum's book about um, Nordic nationalism in music, now he's turning to look at white nationalism in the United States. Um, if you look at white nationalist sites, they're filled with what is determined white music, white visuals, white people. Um, and we have to pay attention to this. This is really important. I was um, yeah, I was trained in folklore, which tends to be celebratory, and I appreciated your attention exactly. to how folklore, folk music throughout history is, is a tool, is a tool for people. We must pay attention to this. Yeah, um, obviously, I agree with everything you're saying, and, I, you know, and I'd add that the Tom's House scene was always ethno-nationalist. It's just that was fine as long as we were liberating ourselves from the Soviet, from the domination of the Soviet Union. Um, but I'd also, you know, I always try to complicate things. And I uh, actually, the reason that I first thought of playing Fight the Power as the walking in music was an amazing story from Boston, which is where I'm from by, and now I'm gonna forget his name because it's so Catholic that I wanna say Michael Patrick Kennedy, but I don't think that's quite right. He wrote a book called All Souls about growing up in Southie in South Boston during the busing crisis when they were trying to keep black kids out of the white schools and white kids from being bused to black schools. And he tells a story about when the buses of black students rolled into South Boston. And he says, our music in South Boston was soul. He said, we did not listen to rock and roll, which we saw, thought of suburban white kid music. We listened only to soul. And as the buses with the black kids rolled into Southie, and as the white Irish kids attacked the buses, they blasted out their windows on their boom boxes, uh, the Isley brothers singing Fight the Power. Um, <laughs> your example of Roma musicians on stage playing the Bulgarian white nationalist music, there's nothing at all unusual about wanting to be the rulers 
and enjoying having what we call in academia, the subalterns play our music for us. Um, so I think it is important to be attentive to the extreme examples where we want our music to be white. But I think it's at least equally important to remember that whatever music we choose to march to, if it helps us march, it's our marching music. And the, you know, the, how we use the music is what gives the music its power. Or rather the power we invest the music with is the power it has. Thank you. It looks like we have another question from Memory Apata. I hope I pronounced that right. Hi, I'm Memory Apata. I'm um, the music and performing arts librarian at Dartmouth College. And I must admit, I feel like a bit of an interloper <laughs> um, in this venue. Um, but I really want to take the opportunity to ask for some advice and um, really enjoyed your presentation and learning from you. Um, so at the library on an annual basis since 2017, we've had um, a sing-in in really <laughs> around the time of um, Donald Trump's election was the time that this started. Um, in an effort to heal as a community um, and do that through the power of song. Um, and I just, I really resonated with the, what you said about the cringe factor <laughs> that you feel um, or felt um, listening to klezmer music being played by no one who was Jewish. Um, because uh, that event often attracts a really, <laughs> a bunch of people that look kind of like me, but maybe 20 or 30 years older. Um, and I often, when I'm facilitating this event, feel that cringe factor, and I'm not really sure how to describe it. Um, but I'm wondering how you're negotiating, if you're still playing blues music, um, mm -hmm. how you negotiate that, and um, if you talk about it when you play. Sure. Uh, typically, I don't talk about it a lot when I play, because typically when I play, you know, I'm, I'm in a bar or wherever, and my job is to be entertaining. Uh, I touch on it, but honestly, the way I, first of all, I should say, I'm described, when I describe that, what you're calling the cringe factor in that synagogue in Poland, I'm talking about my reactions, not about what they were doing. Um, if, you know, I, I'm not saying what they, I, I, I don't have an opinion on what they were doing. I'm describing how it felt to me how weird it felt to me, um, which is not to say I'm not with you. I mean, I, I feel exactly what you're describing in exactly the rooms that you're describing. In terms of my own performances, uh, I never just played blues. I always mixed it with a lot of other stuff, partly because I never wanted to be presented or to present myself as a white blues guy. Uh, the other thing is I have tried very, very hard, uh, not always successfully, to sing in my voice. Um, I mean, I, and this is still a process, you know, I'll still sing a lyric, you know, want to go home, but I ain't got sufficient clothes, uh, was a lyric from a, a Blind Lemon Jefferson song. And a little while ago, I don't remember before or after I recorded it, it struck me that I would say I don't have, not I ain't got. And it takes the same number of syllables. It's not difficult to sing it in my own voice if I stop and think about how would I sing it in my own voice. Um, I mean, I don't know anybody who cringes at the way Hank Williams sings blues. Hank Williams sings his music of his culture, though it's unquestionably blues. Um, and, you know, so I guess what I'd say is it's a constant process of negotiation and it depends what room I'm in and it depends what the circumstances are. And that's as close as I can get to an answer. And 
but I do think it's important, and this is something that's coming up, up a lot these days, for white people in those rooms who are cringing not to feel like they are superior because they are cringing and start make, using that to make a power play towards the other people in the room who may not be cringing. Um, I think if you're in a room full of white people and it makes you uncomfortable, the solution is get into some rooms that aren't just full of white people. Uh, the solution is not, we need to have some more black people in this room. I, I mean, the diversity in quotation marks solution, uh, I'm, I think is toxic. That's about, we would like to maintain our rooms and our power, but want to feel better about ourselves by having some other people here as well while we maintain our rooms and our power. I think we need to get into other rooms where we are the minority if we want to make that kind of outreach. Thank you. That's great. We have time for one more quick question. Uh, I see Carol Muller has her hand raised. Well, um, Elata, this was really, um, this was really amazing. Um, mostly because <laughs> um, of the the like, prof really, I think quite profound um, self examination of your power as a white American. And I say this as somebody who um, has worked a lot with South African jazz musicians, who really did exactly all the things you say, who just borrowed from everywhere, who've listened very widely. Um, when they went into exile, they came to America and found that people really didn't know, didn't even imagine that South Africans could be playing jazz. That was one of the things. Um, Satma, the woman I worked with, she, she always used to say to me, I bring these old songs that I heard in South Africa back to America. And she's like carrying the archive. I mean, these are the irony. The musicians say, is this your own song? And she goes, no, it's American. But it came to yeah. South Africa. And of course, it's changed, right? Um, so then I, I suppose the question really is, and I just I really <laughs> am so grateful for what you are, are doing here. The question then is, what is our responsibility as scholars and researchers and intellectuals and how we carve out a space. I mean, it took me 20 years to write the book I did with Satima because I couldn't find a rhetorical space to talk about South African jazz in any way that didn't seem like I was displacing the American narrative. Because when you deal with minorities, you, you also don't want to say, you need to move over a little bit, share the spotlight. Do you know what I'm saying? So I think that there's, there's a kind of a, the power in representation is something we have to think quite hard about too. And I, I, I don't know, that's really where I am. I'm just really grateful for your very hard self-reflection on in these very complicated and diasporic. It's about diaspora, but in a very different kind of way, right? You are yourself a diasporic subject. You've moved a lot. And in a way that moving has given you the space to think differently perhaps. And I think I've moved too, and that's when I kind of freed myself from a certain connectedness to location and rootedness, right? In, in, in the, the kind of superficial way, not your beautiful way of talking about roots. Um, well, we're, we're really out of time and that's yeah. ideal for me because really my answer is, as, as I think is obvious, I'm trying to negotiate and think about my own relationship to those questions. Mm -hmm. And I certainly don't have other people's relationship to those questions sorted out. Mm -hmm. um, I do think, I mean, the one thing I think is really important is what I just said a minute ago, that I, I mean, the way to, the way to, to, to get outside of being in your white world mm -hmm. is to get outside of being in your white world. Exactly. And the, the, there's no way to remain in your white world, but demonstrate your willingness to go outside it as long as you're not going outside it. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you.
Well, on that note, I'd like to thank Elijah for giving this wonderful talk and generating such a vibrant discussion afterwards. Um, so let's join in virtually, uh, clapping our hands, and um, thank all of you for coming. And for the conference participants, we'll be meeting in 15 minutes or so in, at uh, 1.45 on the second link that you received this morning. So thank you.